Now you, now you can hear me. There it is. Okay. So uh, for, for the people that were watching online, they're like, he's, you know, it's a silent movie this morning. But um, no, it's good to be together and uh, the heat's coming on and warming us up. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the Lord does just in terms of warming our spirits to be in together in his presence this morning. So let's take a moment and pray together and get right down to the business of worshiping our God and King. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for your love your grace, your mercy, your goodness to us, God. You are a good and loving Heavenly Father. We thank you for this chance that we have to, to gather and to worship you and to enjoy some fellowship, God, to be encouraged by one another and, and to be encouraged by your word. God, thank you for the promise of your presence with us, and we invite that presence this morning. May you make your presence known to us, God, by your spirit. Lead us into a, a deeper sense of worship. And we pray that all of this would work together for our good and your glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, stand with us and let's get right to it, singing the church's one foundation. foundation as a church, our foundation as believers is found only in Christ. We look to the one true God for our salvation and for our daily lives. Let's continue to praise Him. One voice in the dark a song that lights up the stars, one breath that gives life, one sovereign in power, who speaks with thunder and fire, one Lord, one King, there is no other that can compare to you. You are the one alone.
the one true God. For all others that might claim to be God alone is the one true God, the one that can offer us forgiveness, the one that can offer us salvation and eternal life. And that comes only through faith in Christ. And through faith in Christ, then God enters into our lives to help us live the kind of life that He desires for us to live, to help us learn to live in obedience to His callings and His commands. And that's, that's not in our strength or to our glory. That's by God's strength and to His glory because it's not through us. It's through Christ in us. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Day by 
seated. Right, well, I'm not sure if any, any of my kids are in the room to head upstairs for Kids Connection, but you guys are dismissed at this point. And uh, for the rest of us, let me just run through a few announcements before we get into our study in the Word today. Uh, a couple of things coming up. One, right after the service this morning, we're going to have our annual business meeting. This is our opportunity to look back and kind of reflect on God's faithfulness and what He's done uh, in our midst here over the past year. Uh, there were annual reports on the back table there. You're welcome to grab one of those after the service. It kind of has a summary from all of the different ministries and summary of how the Lord has blessed us financially and whatnot. So that'll be right after the service. And then as soon as that's concluded, we're all going to head downstairs and enjoy lunch together, and lunch is provided. So hope you can stick around and enjoy the time of fellowship with us. A couple of other things, just to, especially for the ladies, I uh, wanted to highlight again, we have a ladies' Bible study that meets Tuesday mornings uh, at Sydney Allen's house. So Sydney, raise your hand and, and wave there. If you have any questions or would like to get connected, talk to Sydney after the service. Uh, they are just getting started on a new study, so great time to jump in. And then uh, we have a ladies' craft night that is coming up on February 11th. 6.30 at Sherry Hughes' home. There's Sherry. Sorry? Oh, no, it's here at the church. I'm sorry. Sherry Hughes is organizing it, but it's here at the church. My bad. So it'll be downstairs here at the church on February 11th. But if you have questions like I obviously did this morning, talk to Sherry after the service, and she can fill you in on uh, what opportunities uh, you guys are going to be able to take advantage of and enjoy together there. All right, well, let's, uh, let's take a moment again and quiet our hearts before the Lord in prayer, and then we'll open His Word together. Lord, it's good to just pause for a moment, kind of take a, a breath, even a, a spiritual breath, quiet our hearts before you, and Lord, to prepare ourselves to receive what you have for us out of your word. God, you have given us in the Bible here everything that you desire for us to know and understand about you. You have made it available to us, and I praise you that we live in a time when every one of us can have not just a copy, even multiple copies that we can have with us all the time, that we can go to your word with ease, no matter where we are, no matter when it is. And so, God, as we set aside this time to do that very thing this morning, we seek your leading. Lord, it's your word. There's no one better to go to to help us with the interpretation and understanding of it than the author himself. And so, we look to you this morning, God, to be the one who helps us to rightly understand and to see how relevant your word is to our daily lives. Help us to apply the things we learn, that we might live in a way that pleases you and glorifies you. 
I thank you for each of these folks, and I thank you for the time we get to enjoy together now in your word. We ask your blessing in Christ's name. Amen. I'm not sure how many of you know, but uh, Julia and I were high school sweethearts. Uh, we started dating in high school. I was a, a senior. She was a sophomore. Went to both of our proms together, grad nights, uh, various school dances and functions. And I was uh, thinking back and remembering one particular formal dance that we went to. Um, it w- we had planned afterwards to drive from, we were, we were down in Burbank, kind of the San Fernando Valley, LA area. We were going to drive from wherever the dance was held uh, down to Malibu to have dinner at a nice restaurant. And so uh, I, I made plans. Uh, this was back in the day when you had to call information to get the number if it wasn't in your, your phone book, which it wasn't because it was not in my city. So I called information. Uh, this was pre-internet, people, so there was nothing to Google. So I, I called and I said, hey, I'm, I'm looking for this restaurant. And they connected me and they answered with the restaurant name. And I made reservations at the time. And everything was good. And it had been a little while since we'd been to the restaurant, probably a couple of years. But we had been there before and enjoyed it. And so we were looking forward to it. And so we went to the dance, and we had a great time at the dance, and then we hopped into my car, and we drove down to Malibu, and and went through the canyon, ended up down on Pacific Coast Highway, and started driving down PCH uh, on our way to the restaurant, and just talking and having a good time, and I suddenly realized as we were talking and having such a good time that I had driven too far. We were like out of Malibu and into the next city, and I'm like, wow, we must have been having so much fun. I totally missed the restaurant, so we turned around and made our way back, and, you know, kind of looking, kind of talking and laughing, and I ended up all the way back at the canyon road we had come in on and thought, man, I missed it again. So we turned around again, and this time we did no talking. We were like watching every building that went by, and we got back down to where I had turned around the first time and still didn't see it. So we came back a second time, now having gone up and down PCH four times, and finally I... Uh, found a gas station, and I stopped and asked for directions. And I said, hey, we're looking for, uh, you know, it was Don the Beachcombers was the name of the restaurant. Looking for Don the Beachcombers restaurant. Uh, I've been up and down the road here. I, I don't, haven't been there in a couple years. He's like, yeah, uh, see that vacant lot across the street there? That's where it was. You remember that big storm we had last year, year and a half ago? Washed the whole thing out to sea. It's gone. Oh, Wow. Came to find out that there was another restaurant by the same name in a completely different city, and that's who information had connected me with. So apparently we were reserved in some place that was an hour and a half away. We were never going to make it. We didn't let it spoil our evening. We actually ended up at the -the jack-in-the-box that was right there. (laughs) Got ourselves a seat by the window. We could look out and see the ocean. So here I am in my tuxedo and Julia in her formal gown. And, uh, you know, we tried to put a spin on it. Well, I had a a meat entree with a, a red sauce, and we had uh, a, a potato side and uh, in, enjoyed the, the sound of the waves of cars, you know, by outside the window. So, yeah, we had burgers and fries in our formal attire and had a great time anyway. I probably would have done well to have asked for directions beforehand. Uh, I might have saved myself four drives up and down PCH looking for a restaurant that hadn't been there for over a year. You know, we all need directions from time to time, don't we? It, whatever it may be, whether it's directions on how to get somewhere or directions for how to accomplish uh, some task or something, there are times when we have to look to someone who is more knowledgeable than, than we are to help us, to instruct us, to direct us. And that's what the author of our text does in our passage today. He stops to ask God for directions. The psalmist spends the eight verses that we're looking at this morning asking God to direct him in three primary areas of life. He needs instruction, he needs guidance, And he needs provision. And so he seeks God's direction in all of those things. And as we move through our study together in Psalm 119 this morning, we're going to focus on those same 
three basic spiritual needs. We need God's direction because we have much to learn. We need God's direction because we're lost. And we need God's direction to fulfill our spiritual longings. So if you would, take your Bible with me and open it up to the 119th Psalm, roughly in the middle of your Bibles there. Psalm 119, we've been taking this one eight-verse section at a time for the past few weeks. This morning we are in the fifth section of Psalm 119, which begins in verse 33. So Psalm 119, verse 33, follow along as I read our passage for us and then we'll get into the study together. Our author writes, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. So in these verses, the author recognizes that he, like every one of us, he has a need. And we could state it like this, that we need God's direction because we have much to learn. I've noticed over the years, perhaps it's been your experience as well, I've noticed over the years that the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. The more I learn, the more I realize how much more there is to know out there. And we are called to be students of God's Word throughout our lives, to just keep learning, to keep digging into God's Word and seeking to understand and apply it. And that's clearly the desire of the psalmist. In the first couple of verses here, he asked for two things. He asked for education, and he asked for illumination. Look there again at those first two verses. He says, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. And then secondly, verse 34, give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. The first thing that the psalmist recognizes as a need within himself is for education, Teach me, he says, teach me, O Lord. Have you ever noticed that we don't have to be taught to do wrong things? That seems to just come naturally. We don't have to be taught how to sin, how to be disobedient, how to do wrong things in the eyes of the Lord or eyes of our parents or eyes of anyone else for that matter. That just comes all too terribly naturally for us sometimes. On the other side of things, if we want to do the right thing, sometimes that takes a bit more teaching to learn how to actually do it right. Our author wants to learn from the Lord himself. Teach me, Lord, he says. But he's not just looking for facts or knowledge. He wants to learn the way of God's commandments. What he's asking God for here is practical teaching. Not just to learn the statutes, not just to kind of internalize it in his mind that, okay, that's what I committed it to memory, I remember what it says, I can quote it syllable for syllable. He wants to learn the way of God's statutes. He wants to learn how they should impact his life. We've talked about it before, it's, it's not enough for us to just know God's Word. I mean, it's good to know God's Word, we should strive to know God's Word, but we need to go beyond the stage of knowing it to the point of keeping it. Yes, we want to learn it, but we have to then go out and live it. That's what he's asking for here. God, teach me the daily use of your commands. Teach me how they should direct my life. Teach me how I should live in light of and in response to 
your calling, your commands on my life. For instance, the Bible gives us a, a very clear command. It was a, a statement of Christ himself, kind of a summary of, of six out of the ten commandments. He says that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, right? That's a good commandment to know. That's an important thing to know. But we have to do it, not just know it. We need to go after a, a heart of obedience. We need to take what we learn and we need to apply it in practical ways as we seek to obey God at every turn, at every opportunity in our lives. And that's what the psalmist is after. He wants to learn the way of God's commandments. He wants to see it influence his life all the way to the end. He wants to persevere in that to the very end of his days on the earth. And that should be what we strive for as well. We should be looking to obey God's commandments every moment, every day of our lives. Because here's the, the truth. There is no point in the Christian life where we can kind of step back and say, well, I think I've, I've arrived. I have given God enough obedience for this life, so I'm just going to coast from here on out. I mean, that whole, that whole first part of my life, you know, I had my ups and downs, but I think I've done enough that from here on out, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm just going to coast. I'm just going to do life my way. I'm saved, so I'm good. I don't have to worry about it anymore. No, we need to keep striving for obedience all the way through, every day, every moment. But in that, we also need to remember that God doesn't call us to go it alone. God doesn't ask us to strive for obedience relying exclusively on our own strength. He wants to help us obey Him. He wants to help us have the strength to do what is right in His eyes. So we need education. We need to be taught by God. We need Him to teach us how to obey all of His commandments to us. But there's something else that the psalmist acknowledges in the next verse there. Verse 34 he acknowledges not just the need for education, but illumination is what I'd call it. 34, he says, give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. See, we need not just teaching, but understanding. Not just education, but illumination. Understanding means that we have taken that theoretical knowledge and we have learned how to apply it to what we've been taught. We haven't just learned it, we've understood it and kind of applied it now to the actual day in and day out of our lives. That kind of understanding is more than just what goes on in our heads, it's, it's informed activity, it, it has a, an active component to it. It's making the choice to do what we know we're supposed to be doing. That's why the psalmist wants understanding, he says, so that he may observe and keep God's law with his whole heart. I want to do this wholeheartedly, God. I want to do this with every part of me. So we need to seek understanding so that we might be full of obedience as we live before the Lord. We need God's direction because we have so much to learn. We need to be educated in God's ways. We need to be illuminated so that we can live rightly. We need to depend on God for our spiritual instruction. Well, the writer of the psalm knew that he had much to learn, so he stopped and he asked God for instruction. In the next three verses, then, he goes on to acknowledge another need that we all share. We need God's direction because we're lost. Without Him, we're lost. We need God's direction. We need His guidance. We need His leading in life. If we are going to attempt to live lives that please the Lord, we're going to have to have God's direction on how to do so. We have to be shown how to live. We're truly lost without His direction, so our author cries out for God's guidance in three ways. He asks that God would help him to learn the right path, that God would help him to lean on the right word, and that God would help him to look at the right things. Watch for those as I read the next few verses here, beginning in verse 35. He says, Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies. 
and not to dishonest gain. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me according to your ways. We need God's direction. We need to learn the right path. And the question is, but how? Uh, I started working on a, an ambulance crew straight out of high school, started responding to 911 calls out in the, uh, out in the valley, uh, outside of uh, San Fernando Valley there, Santa Clarita, that area. And I can remember ver very early on uh, responding to a call for a man who had decided to go out for a bike ride at night, and he went into an unfinished new housing tract that was being built, it was closed to cars, and he thought, you know, that perfect opportunity, the streets are paved, I can go ride right down the middle of the street, there's no cars, so great safe place to ride. No cars. There were no street lights either. And he ended up riding into an open pit in the middle of the road that had not been sealed over and, and hurt pretty bad. He actually took out most of his front teeth when his mouth connected with the other side of the pit as he fell into it. He had decided to kind of just go it on his own. I can see enough to keep myself in the middle of the street. But he had no idea what was out there. And, you know, in the same way, we can try to go it alone in our lives. We can try to do the best we can with what we can see, with what we understand, try and figure it out on our own. But even if we try and say, I'm going to do my best to figure out God's way on my own. I'm just going to do my best to kind of figure it out on my own. You know, we probably would be as bad or worse than trying to navigate a dark street with open pits. We need God's help to do life God's way. We're better off stopping to ask for directions, but if we're going to ask for directions, we need to make sure our source is reliable. You don't go to just anyone for directions. That's why the psalmist goes straight to the Lord for help learning the path. There in verse 35, make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. He doesn't ask God to carry him. He asks God to make him walk. He, he wants to learn the way of God's commandments because he delights in it. He finds it to be a good way to live. God, make me do this because I know it's good. It, it will truly prove to be my delight. There's so many other passages in Scripture that speak of God's desire to direct us in life. So many different things that speak of God's desire to guide us in the right paths, guide us in following His commandments. One of my favorites for many years comes from the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9, where uh, the author writes, the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And, and it's a very particular wording in, in the original Hebrew. It, it kind of pictures directing and placing every footstep. That we have this idea in our heads of how life should go, but God is the one who will actually lead us as we seek Him. Elsewhere in Psalm 37, 23 and 24, it says that the Lord plans our way and He delights in the way He plans for us. That when we stumble, not if, but when we stumble, God upholds us by the hand. And I love that one because of the picture it creates. If you've Maybe your kids, grandkids, or if you've ever watched a parent with a toddler, you know, toddlers are kind of, you know, unstable as they walk. They're doing that thing. And so they hold mom or dad's hand or grandma or grandpa's hand, and they will trip over just about anything. You know, a, a dandelion in the sidewalk is going to cause them to stumble. And when they stumble, parent kind of just lifts them up by the hand. The little legs go until they get their feet back under them, and they let them keep walking, right? The parent doesn't just go, whoops, sucks to be you. That's what God does for us. God upholds us by the hand. He doesn't let us get thrown head over heels as He leads us according to His way. He says, when you stumble, I have you by the hand. So we need to let God be the one to help us learn the right path. Secondly, the psalmist asks for God's direction in leaning on the right word. Take a look again at verse 36. He says, incline my heart to your testimonies and not 
to dishonest gain. And I think the psalmist helps us see a distinction here between wants and needs. We usually have a lot of both, but I think we can be awful prone sometimes to thinking that we need something that really we just want it really bad. We probably don't need it. You remember when you were kids, right? You needed that toy that came up in the commercial or was in the catalog. That You needed it. No, you probably didn't need it, but you really wanted it bad. And it's the same thing as adults. You know, yeah, I, I need, I don't know, I need a new car. I need a new job. Well, you know, if you have a job that's paying you, that's more than a lot of people have sometimes. If you have a car that's running, well, praise God you have a running car. You might want, and, and maybe there's nothing wrong with that want. That's okay. But distinguishing between what are truly wants and what are truly needs is important because we want all sorts of things. The principle that, that we see here in verse 36 is that the way that the heart leans is the way the life leans. Whatever way we've kind of inclined our hearts, whatever things we lean our hearts towards, that's kind of the direction our life starts to move. So which way does your heart lean? What preoccupies your mind? What is it that, that you lean towards? Maybe, maybe you lean towards sports, you know, maybe that, whether you're playing them or, or watching them on TV. Yeah, I love sport. Man, I can't get enough of sports. I've got, I've got all the sports channels and that's just, I, that's on my heart all the time. Or, or maybe you lean towards hobbies, you know, and again, it's not that these things are, are bad necessarily at all in and of themselves. It's just, you know, these are things we can lean our hearts towards. Maybe you lean towards hobbies like, uh, I don't know, reading or, or, or sewing or internet surfing or gardening, whatever it is. Maybe you find yourself leaning towards whatever you can get. Get whatever you can get. You know, looking for the next way to get ahead, looking for the next way to get something more. That's that last one there. That was the concern of our author here. He knew his heart. And he knew his heart leaned towards what he could get. He knew his heart leaned towards greed or, or covetousness. He wanted things. And so he made a decision. God, help me incline my heart. Help me lean my heart towards what you desire for me. Help me lean my heart towards your word above and before anything else. You have to wonder, what would our lives look like if we decided, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm going to lean my heart towards God's Word. I'm going to make understanding and applying what God says to me in the Bible. I'm going to make that the, the number one priority in my life, to seek the Lord through His Word and to do it His way. Well, if we were inclining our hearts towards God's Word all the time, you know what we would be? We would be speaking to each other kindly, treating each other respectfully. We'd be helping one another. We'd be doing the right thing even when it's hard to do the right thing, we'd love. We'd love the way God loves us. Our hearts are prone to leaning in the, the wrong directions, and the only way to cure a, a wrong-leaning heart is by asking God to lean it the other way. We have to have Him incline our hearts towards His testimonies, towards His Word. So let's ask God to help us lean on the right Word. And then thirdly, our author asks for guidance in looking at the right things. Verse 37, turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. Verse 36 had a, a positive request, you know, lean my heart the right way, God. Verse 37 here has the negative side of things. Okay, it's not lean my heart towards the good things, it's help me to lean away from, turn my eyes away from the bad things, the things that I don't need to be going after, the wrong things. God, help me turn my eyes away from, from looking at anything that morally has no value. Help me not to look at those things. Vanity is all the stuff in the world that we can end up wanting in the wrong way. Stuff the Bible would call in, in 1 John, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. All that stuff, and again, it's not always that the things themselves are bad. Sometimes the things themselves are morally neutral. 
but we can want them so bad that they start to edge out God's rightful place in our life. And that becomes more important to us than God and a right relationship with Him. So all of these things that are vanity, sin clearly is vanity for us to do the wrong thing in God's, God's eyes, that's vanity. Dishonest gain, that's clear from what the psalmist says here. Dishonest gain is vanity. You know what else is vanity? Sinful, self-conceited pride, that's vanity. Trying to elevate myself. Houses are vanity, cars are vanity, money's vanity. Anything that we want more than we want God, it, it has slipped into the realm of becoming vanity. And the psalmist asks that God would turn his eyes away from such things. Not that God would close his eyes, but help him to look away, to look in the right direction. Because we need to have our eyes open. We don't have our eyes open, we run into things, we fall into things. We've got to have our eyes open, but we need help in directing our eyes to the right things. It's not a matter of trying to hide from the things of the world and saying, I just want to shut myself in a closet here and hide from everything that's going on around me. We don't close ourselves off so we don't see those things. It's a matter of teaching ourselves to focus our eyes on what's best, what's better than all of those things. It's a matter of helping ourselves, teaching ourselves, asking God to help us put our eyes on Him constantly. Look to Him. We need God's help with that, though, in turning our eyes away from vanity. Because, you know, that is, that is one of the primary ways, by the way, our eyes, that's one of the primary things that Satan uses to bring temptation into our lives. Things we see. We see things that we want, and we begin to want them so badly, they take God's place in our lives. We begin to see something and begin to desire it, whether it's another person or something that person has, it, it starts to eat us up and wrap us up. And instead of allowing our eyes to wander, what we should do is, is do what the psalmist here says. We need to ask God to help us live according to His way. Revive me in your ways, God. Help me to come back from the direction I've done things, maybe on occasion, maybe far too often. Draw me back from that. Revive me in your ways, doing it your way. Help me to look at the right things. Because if we're truly going to learn the right path, lean on the right word, and look at the right things, we need the right direction. We need God's direction to do that. We use a lot of different things to direct us in life. Uh, it's gotten so easy now, hasn't it? Most, most smartphones, they've got the built-in GPS, and you can get turn-by-turn -turn directions that'll talk to you. You can even choose the accent and the voice that's talking to you. It's It's easy. So you've got a, a nice GPS, it'll tell you where to go. Hopefully not down some boat ramp into the lake, but you know, generally they direct you the right way. GPS is great, as long as your battery's working. Because if your battery's not working, it doesn't do you any good at all, does it? Well, then I'd use a compass, you know. Oh yeah, compass is good, especially if it's not one that depends on your battery. A nice compass always points north. That is fantastic. It can show you exactly which direction you're going. But if you don't have a map, I know which direction I'm going, but I have no idea where I'm going. So, okay, well then, then I need a map. Maps are fantastic, especially if you know how to read one. A map is a wonderful thing because it shows you the lay of the land and everything that's out there. But if you have no direction, no, direction, no idea which way north is, that map isn't going to do you much good either. Say, so, well, I'm going to use all three then, and that would be fantastic. That's probably the best way to get around. If you have your GPS that's working and has batteries, you have a compass and you have a map and you know how to use all those things, well, you can get just about anywhere. Using all of those things together would be the most reliable way of getting to our destination. We'd be covered no matter what. Well, spiritually then, we need to use every means that God has provided to us in order to follow the way He wants us to live our lives. God's given us His Word. He's given us His Holy Spirit. God's given us brothers and sisters in Christ, our, our, our spiritual family, to come alongside us and encourage us and pray for us and help us. We need God's direction because we're, we're lost. And we need to depend on Him for spiritual direction. One final area of need shows up at the end of this section we're looking at this morning. Here, our author moves from 
needs to that, that realm of more stuff we'd call wants, or in this case, longings. We need God's direction to fulfill our spiritual longings. Because he, here's the reality, we're dependent on God for everything. Whether we realize it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, we depend on God for everything, every single day. If God decided He was done and decided, I'm going to withdraw my power and my presence from this universe I've created, do you know what would grind to a halt in an instant? Everything around us, every part of us. We're dependent on God for everything. Our author knows this, and so with the last three verses of our passage, he expresses three longings. A longing for God's response, a longing for relief, and a longing for revival. Watch for those three as I read the last three verses of our passage. He says, establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Take away my reproach, which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. The first longing we read of is for God's response. You know what the author longs for here in the simplest of words? Answered prayer. He just wants God's answer. Pleads that God would establish His word because there's times in our lives where everything in our world seems to get shaken, doesn't it? It seems like everything is falling apart. And, and I don't know what that's looked like in your life. Maybe, maybe it's looked like the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's looked like the loss of a job or the loss of a home or, or I don't know. It just, and when those things come in more than one, they come in twos, they come in threes, it can seem like, man, the very fabric of my world is coming apart at the seams, everything is falling apart, and that can leave us in the position of beginning to even question, well, what if God doesn't keep His promises either? Nobody else in my life seems to be keeping their promises. Everything's falling apart. What if, what if God doesn't answer? What if God doesn't help me? That's what the psalmist prays about in verse 38, that God would answer with what God had already promised. It's the cry for God to do what He said He would do. God's promises, the psalmist says, they, they produce in Him a, a reverence or a, a, a fear. And not, not the kind of terrified, shaking in your boots kind of fear, but that, that kind of respect sort of side of fear. Because, yeah, we ought to be afraid of failing God at any point of our lives. That's, that's appropriate. But what we're to fear as as those who have put their faith in Jesus for our forgiveness and salvation, our fear is not about losing that salvation. Our fear is not about coming under God's judgment. Our fear is to be about disappointing God, about just not doing the things that He wants for us to do. What we need to fear is taking salvation for granted. Don't take it for granted. Don't, don't take that attitude that says, well, I'm forgiven, so now I can do whatever I want. I can just live however because it's done. I've got my eternal fire insurance has been purchased. I'm, I'm in. I believed in Jesus, and so I don't, I don't have to worry about it anymore. We should fear living life like it doesn't matter what we do. It does. We need to seek to honor the Lord with our lives. So let's long for God's loving response. Let's long to see His answered prayers in our lives and in our world. Second, the author speaks of a longing for relief from reproach. There in verse 39, he says, take away my reproach, which I dread, for your ordinances are good. What our author's talking about here in terms of reproach is uh, you know, maybe that cruel mocking that we can sometimes endure. Uh, probably most of us can remember some of that from junior high. Seems to be a great time in life for that sort of thing. But, but you know, it happens throughout our lives in different ways. Sometimes it comes from other people. They may mock us for our beliefs. You may be mocked for believing the Bible is true, for believing in Christ for your salvation. 
Sometimes people point to something else in our lives. Sometimes people are just looking for a reason to point fingers, you know. You, you say you want to try and live a good life, and the moment you do something wrong, they say, ha, see, you're no better than anyone else, and they just, they just want to tear you down. So sometimes that comes from other people. Sometimes reproach comes from within us. Well, we kind of are a, a reproach to ourselves, because I'll tell you what, I know my own failings all too well. I know how I screw up far better than any of the rest of you know how I screw up. And you know that for yourselves as well. We all know how we can do it wrong from day to day, and we can blast ourselves for falling short of God's commandments. And still other times the reproach is directed at us by the accuser himself. Satan, the accuser. The one, the guy who works so hard to push temptation on us to do something that's wrong. He, he butters it up and paints it real nice and makes it look so good and so appealing and so enjoyable. It's pleasing to the eyes. And then as soon as we cross that line and do that thing that we knew we shouldn't have been doing, he, he changes his outfits and, and he takes off the salesman outfit, you know, the, the, and, and he begins to now pose as an angel of light and kind of does that, you know, you call yourself a Christian. Look what you just did. You know what? No self-respecting Christian would have said what you just said. I can't believe that God even loves you if that's the way you're going to respond to him. So he draws us in to try and help, uh, encourage us to do what's wrong and then accuses, it for us, accuses us for it the moment we do it. We all need relief from reproach. We all need God's help. Only God can take that away. So let's long for relief, for deliverance from the power of sin. When we fail... We need to confess those sins to Him. We need to ask Him to forgive us, to restore that right relationship with us. Victory that we can have here, it's only going to come to us through faith in Christ. There's no other way. No other way to have the victory. We cannot succeed in our own strength in this area of our life. We have to depend on God. Now, the very last longing that the psalmist records in these verses is a longing for revival, a longing to live a righteous life. That last verse, verse 40, Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. You know, throughout this entire passage, the psalmist has made clear just how dependent he is on the Lord. He knows his own weaknesses. He knows his own failures. He knows that his help has to come from the Lord. And the final verse of the passage here, the author presents one of his greatest desires. His greatest desire is to, in all things, be conformed to God's will for his life. He hungers for righteousness. He strongly desires that God would bring new life into his ability to live in obedience. I think sometimes that those who don't have a relationship with God through faith in Christ, I think sometimes they just don't understand how a Christian, how a believer in Christ could actually uh, enjoy, could, could actually um, desire to live under God's rules, under God's commandments. Most people don't want rules. Most of the time, we just want the freedom to do whatever we want to do. But the truth is, friends, that as believers in Christ, we will only find ourselves truly at peace with and, and even be able to delight in God's precepts. We can only do that because of God's great love and His promises to us. And then we find that it is truly a joy to live the way that God calls us to live. There's a joy that comes from doing it right. And there's so much to look forward to in seeking God's will for our daily lives. Because we're going to have eternity to enjoy in God's presence. So let's long for revival. Let's seek to live righteous lives. Truthfully, for all these longings, there's only one possible source of fulfillment, and that's God. He's the only one who can fulfill these spiritual longings. doesn't matter wherever else you look, you're not going to find it anywhere else except in a relationship with God. We need to depend on God 
for his spiritual provision because he alone can supply our spiritual longings. God is trustworthy. We can trust him for everything. He's able to do so much more than we could ever ask or or even imagine. So let's depend on God for spiritual instruction, direction, and provision. Right along with the psalmist here, let's depend on God for spiritual instruction, direction, and provision. Because we're truly dependent on God for all things. To know His Word, we need to seek His instruction. To live lives of obedience, we need to seek His direction. To see our spiritual longings fulfilled, we need to seek His provision. Don't live your life the way so many of us guys do when we're driving to an unfamiliar place. Stop and ask for directions, you know? Stop and ask God for directions. Depend on Him for spiritual instruction, direction, and provision. Let's close in prayer. God, I thank you that you offer us those very things. You invite us to come to you and to seek it and to ask because it's your desire to provide instruction, direction. It's your desire to provide for our spiritual needs and so much of our daily needs as well. You do that out of your great love for us. God, thank you for loving us the way you do. Lord, help us to live in response to that, to to live rightly in response to that, to offer back to you, God, our very lives because you're the one who has essentially purchased them back through Christ's death and resurrection that as we confess our sins to you, trusting in Christ alone for our salvation, We receive new life that we would not have otherwise. So, Lord, take those lives. Help us to live rightly. Lives of faithfulness, holiness, and righteousness before you. We know we can only do this in your strength and with your help, and we thank you for offering that to us. Praise you now in Christ's holy name. Amen. Stand with us, and let's close out our time with the simple chorus, Take My Life.
May God take you as you surrender yourself to him and help you to be the person he wants you to be, help you to live the life he wants you to live. Seek him for it. He is faithful. God bless you guys. I pray you have a wonderful week this week. Our business meeting will be starting up in just a few minutes, so take a moment, socialize, enjoy the time together. We'll have our business meeting, and then immediately following that, we'll head downstairs for lunch. I hope you can join us. God bless you guys.